Um, we're going to be continuing our study through Hebrews. Um, we're going to finish chapter 5 and go into about the middle of chapter 6 this evening. So if you want to go ahead and get, get turned there, um, Hebrews chapter 5, we'll be starting in verse 11. And uh, the topic here, so what we've been going through in Hebrews, we've been looking at Jesus relative to a few comparisons of the Old Testament, the old service of worship, the old, the old ways, comparing Jesus to the angels, comparing Him to the prophets, the priests, um, and all these things. And uh, there's been a few warnings and stops here in between. Don't lose faith. And this is one of those, it's, it's more so a rebuke and a, and a warning altogether here, not to, uh, to, to uh, really just the, the lack of progressing in the faith, what that will do and, and what, he's, what, what he's concerned about in these Hebrew Christians right now. So as, as I just said, the writer has just discussed the, uh, the comparison of Jesus being the perfect high priest in chapter 4. And uh, the focus of our text uh, now he's turning to and giving a rebuke to the Hebrews for their spiritual immaturity and the lack of progression in the knowledge of Christ and the dangers that will become those pitfalls. Um, so, to, so to start off, let's go back just a few verses uh, to Hebrews chapter 5, verse 5, and we'll, we'll start there to give a little more pretext into to what we're going to be looking at. So Hebrews chapter 5, starting at verse 5. So also Christ did not glorify Himself to become high priest, but it was He who said to Him, You are My Son, today I have begotten You. As He also says in, other, in another place, You are a priest forever according to, the order of, according to the order of Melchizedek, who in the flesh of, uh, who in the days of His flesh, when He had offered up prayers and supplications with vehement cries and tears to Him who was able to save Him from death and was heard because of His godly fear, Though he was a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. And having been perfected, he became the author of, our t of eternal salvation to all who obey him, called by God as high priest, according to the order of Melchizedek. So here is our focus now, starting at verse 11. We'll read through verse 14 for now. Uh, of whom we have much to say and hard to explain, since you have become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers... You need someone to teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. You have come to need milk and not solid food, for everyone who partakes of only of milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But solid food belongs to those who are of full age, that is, those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Um, so, as I said, he, he, he now stops his topic. Um, he's saying... We're, we're about to make some comparisons of, of Jesus' priesthood and the priesthood of Melchizedek, but you're really not able to, to take it in right now because you've grown dull of hearing. And uh, this is going to be tough to explain even with you focused and you know competent. So he's giving them kind of a rebuke here that they have not progressed to the level that they should be at with their spiritual knowledge. Um, they had been converted for a time span that would have been more than, than adequate to to build up their faith, to increase in knowledge, and uh, we're going to be going through that. But at this point where they should have been capable of being able to teach others, they needed to be retaught the, the first principles, the, the foundational uh, principles of, of the doctrine of Christ. And we're going to go through those things this evening and uh, continue through our study there. But if anything, they had actually begun to, to digress in knowledge, and that's what happens if you stop growing, if you stop pushing forward, you become stagnant. And idleness does not equal uh, idleness. It, it equals downgrading. You're, you're never going to um, just stop studying the Bible and not digress. You're going to lose progress. You're not going to stay where you're at. And that's the issue here. They have to be retaught the, the original things that they already have known. And they've become spiritually lazy. So what we just read through, um, there's a few things in there. We'll look at some of the signs here that he gave of their spiritual immaturity. The first one he said that they'd become dull of hearing. That just means sluggish to listen, to comprehend, inattentive, lacking, uh, lacking focus and concentration on something. Um, then next he said that they were needing to be taught again the first principles. When I... When I read that a couple of times, trying to think of an example, um, I immediately thought of 
uh, Caleb can relate very much to this, is uh, coaching five to seven-year-old boys in football. Needing be, to be retaught the, the principles over and over and over and over. We're on defense, what are we doing? Block, no, tackling. We're on offense, we have the ball, what are we doing? Blocking. And it's just over and over and nobody knows where to line up, nobody knows what to do. The guy that's like the offensive tackle is trying to tackle a linebacker. And it's just, it's chaos. And it's not that they don't know and it's not that they can't know. Some of these kids, you know, maybe come back for two years in a row and they still don't know where to line up. They still don't know what to do. They still don't know what offense means. And it's the same thing here. <coughs> they have become disinterested to the point that they're not willing to learn. They're not willing to put in the focus. They're not willing to make the applications and to keep it in their mind. And they've, they've really just become disinterested. It's in the case of the kids, you know, it's just a, they're there and they really don't care much beyond that sometimes. And that's, that's the point that, you're, that they're getting at when you become spiritually uninterested uninterested and lazy in uh, studying the Word. And then he says they're only able to partake milk just like a baby. They're an adult but with a baby diet. They can't, they can't handle any meat. They, they can only handle the simple, the most simple to understand truths. And it says they're unskilled in the Word. And this really just means they're, they're ineffective in making any application. They can't use the Word of God in a conversation. They can't put it to application in their lives because they don't understand it and they don't know it. And it, the final thing is there is they can't handle meat. Um, that, that's just simply the, the more complex, difficult to understand truths of the Bible that require focused study and attention. Um, they just can't handle those things again. And that's all of these things. It's, 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 it's expected for a new convert, for a babe in Christ to be um, maybe all of those things. Um, and that's perfectly acceptable for a babe in Christ, but it's not acceptable for a mature Christian who's been in the church for years. I won't put a time limit on it necessarily. We all learn at different rates. We have different mental capacities and capabilities there, but we all know what's been long enough to mature and to understand and to be at that level at a minimum. But that that's what the uh, rebuke is. So saying they need to relearn the, the first principles, the elementary principles there. And that's what we're going to look at next. He lists, lists out all of the foundational principles. We're going to spend a, a bit of our time just going through those. It should be stuff that we all understand and know is, as seasoned Christians, we, we should have an expectation of understanding all these things, and being able to te teach others these things also. If you're, if you're new to the church, if you're, if you're a babe in Christ, maybe you don't know all these things well enough, so we'll go through a couple things. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any given one, but we'll, we'll brush through them all and then we'll go on. But as, as seasoned Christians, while we're looking at these topics, ask yourselves, could you carry on a conversation? Could you lay all these things out to somebody who is interested in the church? If you, if you have a, a no answer to that, you need to be uh, evaluating your study habits, your, your interest in the church, and, the, and the, uh, the focus and effort that you put into spiritually growing. So uh, Hebrews 6, verses 1 through 3, and this is where he's going to explain what these elementary principles are that the, uh, the Hebrews were lacking. Hebrews 6, verse 1, Therefore, leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. So the word principles, that just means um, doctrine, word, first, in, first instructions of Christ. That's, that's all it is. So uh, leaving these principles, does it's not apply, of course, they're abandoning these things, but they are, after these things are established, they will move on to, to uh, more difficult to understand things. Thinking about that is just like moving on to another grade level. You don't abandon everything you learned in kindergarten when you go to first grade. It's a building process, and this is the foundation. This is the starting point. This is where you must begin to make any progress. Just like a house. You can't build a house without a foundation and expect it to last very many years at all. All right, so the first thing he mentions there is repentance. I think we're all pretty familiar with that, but 
just in a definition, it's a reversal of decision from, uh, of pra from practicing sin to turning away from it. It's a, a change of mind that leads to a change in life. It's a change that you're mentally no longer going to do the, the things that you've done in the past and that you are going to proactively do what's right. That's what repentance is. Matthew 4 and 17 says, From that time on, Jesus began to preach, Repent, which means change your mind, change your life, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Acts 2 and 38, Peter talking to the, the Jews at Pentecost, the people who had just crucified Jesus, says to them, Repent, change your mind, change your life, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. The next thing he mentions there is faith. And uh, faith is the, really there's a couple, couple things here. Um, but it, it's the, you have to have some knowledge of God's Word. You have to be able to, you, you agree with that Word. Uh, you trust the Word to the point that it leads you to obedience. Those are the things that are, you know, are composing faith. And uh, you have to have all those things there. You have to have an understanding. You have to agree with it. You have to trust it. And you have to be prompted to obedience of it. You have to be prompted to action. That's the kind of faith we're talking about. Hebrews 11.6 says, But without faith it is impossible to please Him. For he who comes to God must believe that He is and that He is the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. Also, James talking about faith. in James chapter 2, verse 26 says, For as the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So faith in God is our driving force to act in obedience to His Word because we trust what He says and we have a hope of what's going to come. And that's why we act on His promises is because of our faith. If you didn't, if you didn't believe the Word, you wouldn't have faith. You wouldn't be moved to action. If you didn't trust God's promises, you wouldn't be moved to action. Faith is that driving motivator for us to, to obey All right, so the third thing mentioned there is baptism. Um, there's a couple of things that we can uh, talk about in baptism. It's a symbol of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Um, Romans 6, 1 through 4 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who have died to sin live any longer in it? Or, you, or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into His death? Therefore we were buried with Him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. <clears throat> baptism is the process by which our sins are washed away. So then Acts 22, 16. After being baptized, we are added to the church. So then Acts 2, 38 through 41. And then uh, it also says it's the means by which we are saved. 1 Peter 3 and 21. It says, there is also an antitype which now saves us, baptism, not the removal of the filth of the flesh, but, but the answer of a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And then the next one is the laying on of hands. You may kind of scratch your head a little bit when we're talking about basic principles, you know, first principles. And then we, we start talking about laying on of hands. But I think it'll make sense as we talk about it a little more. There's a couple, couple instances that the laying on of hands is used throughout the Bible, even from the Old Testament. It's not a new concept. It wouldn't have been a new concept to these Hebrew Christians. It would have been an understandable concept to them also. But the laying on of hands was done primarily in the New Testament when, when uh, mo multiple instances in which people were, were miraculously healed by the power of uh, the Holy Spirit through the apostles, through Jesus. Um, they multiple times where they laid hands on them to heal them. Uh, also in uh, the ways in which the, uh, the apostles' powers that were given by the Holy Spirit were transferred to, to other men while they were alive. They had that power to transfer that gift to, to other people through the laying on of hands. And then the primary point we're going to look at here is that the laying on of hands was used to, uh, to appoint uh, men to, to a specific service and function in the church. And that's what we'll see. Um, those such as elders, deacons, and evangelists. The first example of that we'll see is in Acts chapter 6, verses 1 through 6. We'll read that pretty quickly. Uh, Acts chapter 6, starting at verse 1. 
Now in those days when the number of disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the multitude of disciples and said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Therefore, brethren, seek out from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, excuse me, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to, to prayer and to the ministry of the Word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith, and of the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. And when they had set them, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. So laying hands on them was the symbol that, that they had publicly commissioned them to do this specific work. And that's the process throughout the church. Um, and it's the process that we still do today when we ordain someone to service. Uh, that same thing is done. 2 Timothy 5, verse 22. This is Paul talking to Timothy about not being too hasty to ordain someone as an elder. It says, Do not lay hands on anyone hastily, nor share in people's sins. Keep yourself pure. And uh, just making the point there that um, the laying on of hands was a... Uh... Sorry, I just kind of lost my, my spot here. Makes a point to Timothy that does not need to appoint or ordain an elder in a hurry. He needs to prove out that man over time and through through uh, through evidence. Know that that man is fit to serve. So, uh, looking at this more, I, I was listening to uh, Nate Bibbins. He had a a, a, a lesson where, it, where he covered uh, these these verses in Hebrews, and and he made a reference this as a as a description of the church organization or leadership appointment process. And I, I think I agree with that. And I, this is really the primary reasons is that, um, as far as being the, these being the foundational principles of the church for all generations, we don't have these miraculous powers that are, the other two ex examples are, are pertaining to, but we do have this church organization and leadership structure from the early church and we still practice that throughout the years. Whether or not it's been made a focus, that's not really material. It should be made a focus throughout all the years and maybe it's just not as as a made a focus to us and we don't think about it when we hear the laying on of hands, but that is the, I think, the primary uh, focus to be drawn out from that. That it specifically, um, laying on of hands re refers to the establishment of the church leadership. And I feel like I'm rambling here for a second, so we're going to move on now to the resurrection of the dead. So this is, we all should be very, very familiar with talking about the resurrection, what it is. But uh, it's proved and shown in Christ what's going to take place with us as well at the end of this age. When all of us who have died will have a, have a reunion with our with our body and our soul will come back together and we will be brought out of the ground very literally uh, to meet the Lord to be judged at the end of time here. And this was not this was not a new to Christianity principle either. We can see back to Daniel and other places of the Old Testament, the Jews were aware that there would be a resurrection of the dead. They didn't know all the de details about it, but, but we can see that there. Daniel 12, I'll read verses 1 through 3. It says, At that time Michael shall stand up, the great prince who stands watch over the sons of your people, and there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time your people shall be delivered. Everyone who is found written in the book, and many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to everlasting shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. We also see Paul defending the resurrection in 1 Corinthians 15, starting there at verse 16. It says, For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. He's making the point that if Christ hasn't risen from the dead, which we all believe, he's making the same point that just at, for that same reason that Christ has risen from the dead, we will also rise from the dead. Uh, back to verse 18. Then, then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men most pitiable. 
But Christ is now, but now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since by man came death, by man also came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ all shall be made alive. But each one in, in his own order, Christ the first fruits, afterward those who are Christ at his coming. And then, as I said, following the resurrection, and the final point that he makes here as being the uh, foundational principles here is the uh, eternal judgment. At the end of this age, after the resurrection, we are all going to be judged um, for the works that we've done on this earth. Um, this is not a... I think sometimes people think that it's just the saints that are going to be resurrected and go to heaven and the, the you know sinners are going to be dead and dead for eternity. That's not the case. Um, good and evil are going to be either rewarded or punished for an eternal punishment, whether it be heaven or hell. A reward or an eternal reward or an eternal punishment. And we can see that in Acts chapter 17. We'll look at two different um, verses here. Acts chapter 17, 30 through 31. This is just talking about the judgment in general. Um, Acts 17, verse 30. Truly, these times of ignorance God overlooked, but now commands all men everywhere to repent, because he has appointed a day on which he will judge, judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of all this by raising him from the dead. In Matthew 25, this is Jesus talking about the final judgment. We're going to read verses 31 through 34, then we'll skip down and read a couple more verses. Um, but Matthew 25, starting at verse 31, it says, When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all His holy angels with Him, then He will sit on the throne of His glory, and all the nations will be gathered before Him. He will separate them one from another, as a shepherd divides his sheep from the goats. And he will set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right hand, Come, you blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. And he goes on into to why they deserve that and why they are receiving that, that, that reward. And we skip down to verse 41. Then he will also say to those on the left hand, Depart from me, you cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And then down to verse 46. And these will go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into everlasting life. So those are the two choices that are laid out very clearly. Eternal punishment or eternal life in heaven. So, as I said, these, these six, six principles, repentance, faith, baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection, and the final judgment, these are foundation principles, elementary principles it calls them. These are, these are the topics that we should all be very well taught in, very well understanding of, and capable of, of teaching these principles to others. And if we're not, then we are, if, if we're any kind of a seasoned Christian, if we've been in the church for any significant amount of time, and we're not capable of doing that, we're in, we're in a bad place. But as I said, foundation principles, they're the beginning. That doesn't necessarily mean they're easy and that you know, you're going to understand everything in, in the snap of a finger. But uh, over time, we all, we all should be able to come to that knowledge in a pretty reasonable amount of time. Building a house, a foundation for a house isn't easy work either, and if it isn't done right, it's going to result in problems in the following building processes and also potential structural issues over the, over the lifetime of that house. So getting that foundation laid properly is very important. So that, as I said, there's there's no excuse for a mature Christian, a mature in years Christian, to to not be able to understand these concepts well enough to study them with others, to lay them out to others in in some form or fashion. And we're not all we're not all public teachers, and uh, no one's expecting everybody to be able to give a lesson on maybe any one of these foundational principles. But you can teach somebody privately. You can have studies in your home. You should be able to have that conversation at work with somebody who's interested in the gospel. You should be able to teach somebody in any one of those areas. And if we can't lay out these truths on one of these levels, then we are, we are immature Christians. That's, 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 the, that's the result. That's the, the truth about it. We can try to say, well, I, I'm not that. Yeah, you don't have an excuse with these foundational principles. If you're competent enough to understand the gospel to obey it, you're competent enough to understand these principles and be well, 
be well enough educated in them to to return them back to others, to reteach them. And the reason I'm, that sounds so harsh is, is because it's the truth. We're about to look at the further warnings of not progressing, being spiritually immature, and, and the consequences of it. And it's not my... It's just not my opinion. It's the Word of God that's saying these things. So now we're going to look at that. Uh, it gives a warning of falling away. And all of this is still you know, on the, on the focus of spiritual immaturity. And this is the reason for falling away. But uh, we'll pick up there at Hebrews 6, starting at verse 4. We'll read verses 4 through 6. It says, For it is impossible... For those who are once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the, the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put, into, put Him to an open shame. Let's, we'll read that twice because there's a lot of wording in that. and Even me studying this over and over, it took me a while to, to, to get to the point where I felt confident enough to even to teach it myself. But Hebrews 6, 4 through 6, for it, is, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put into an open shame. So we're going to walk through this very... Uh, just a contextual analysis, who, what, when, where, why kind of questions, and uh, break this down to where I think we can all understand it here. So, as I said, this is still in the context of spiritual immaturity. He's just rebuked them for their lack of understanding the foundational principles, and he immediately goes into this, this warning here. So, who is he talking to? He's talking to Christians who are converted from Judaism specifically. He's talking to the Hebrew church. The, the Hebrew Christians here. Uh, these Christians were under serious persecution, as we've already said. They have came out of Judaism. All of their family, all of their friends are Jews. They've stepped out, really risking a lot, their reputation in the community and all these things to obey Christ. And uh, they have rejected the law of Moses and, they're, and they have committed themselves to, to following Christ. So that's who he's talking to here. And what is he saying? Saying it's impossible to restore one who has fallen away from the faith back to repentance. When you hear that, you kind of wonder, you think, so someone leaves the church, are they, are they gone for good? Are they, automa are they completely lost with no hope ever? I don't think that's completely the case. We're going to look at some things further, but uh, th when you read it, that's immediately the conclusion that's pretty easy to draw there. But when we look at the word fallen away, um, it, it's kind of anyway the word apostatize which is a strange word to me when I looked up apostatize um, like in a verb it says to become an apostate okay what help is that I don't know what either of those words mean but as you, as you put in application it means to forsake or abandon one's belief faith or allegiance that's what that means to forsake to abandon it to to withdraw from it, to like 180, repent from doing it, is what we're talking about here. In this case, these Christians would be denouncing Christ and His ability to save them, uh, save their souls, and be reverting back to the Mosaic Law. That's what we're talking about here. Um, so, he says, when, we ask the when, so after having become established in Christ, and they do that, that's when they cannot be converted back to repentance. He's speaking, um, some, some uh, would like to argue those who are once saved, always saved, that such a person who, is, who was converted and then left and says they can't be brought back to repentance was never actually converted, but that's not the case. Uh, we'll go through a list of things here that he mentions about He's speaking about those who were once enlightened. They have tasted the heavenly gift. They have partook in the Holy Spirit. They have tasted the good word of God. They knew the powers of the age to come. All of these things. These, these people have obeyed the gospel. They've repented of their sins. They've, they've confessed Christ as their Lord and Savior as being the Son of God. 
they were baptized and they received the Holy Spirit. They were just as much Christians as you as I are, maybe more. There's no reason to, to believe anything otherwise. They were instructed in the foundation principles of Christ's doctrine. They were instructed in repentance and faith, baptism, the laying on of hands, the resurrection, and, and eternal judgment. They knew all these things. They have forsaken the Mosaic Law and committed to following Christ. This letter wasn't written to potential converts who might do that. It was written to converts who have left Judaism and have accepted Christ. And then why? Why is he saying it's impossible to renew them to repentance? And it's, that, it's really that simple. They've rejected Christ as a means of salvation. In doing so, they put Him to an open shame. Symbolically, they're, they're crucifying Him again. They're saying He is not the Savior. He is not the Son of God. It's more than a simple falling away to sin and becoming unfaithful. So, uh, you know, many fall away but still maybe believe that Christ is the way, the, the one true way, and that they may be acknowledged that and they, they may still fall away to sin and they're still lost. I'm not down, downplaying that, but there's still opportunity for them to repent, for them to come back, for, them to, for their heart to be softened and to, uh, to make things right once again. They're... they're their hope is not gone as, as these peoples are. It's a clear and intentional denouncing of Christ as Savior and King. It's a claim that Christ is not the way, not the truth, not the light. And it's, it's a claim that He is not the Son of God, but when you make Him not the Son of God, you're calling Him a liar and a fraud, and you're saying He is basically very worthy of that crucifixion that He had, and you're doing it again symbolically there. And they cannot be restored to repentance for those things. They can't receive forgiveness. They can't re be reconverted due to the hardness of their hearts. Um, God is a, they have hardened their hearts and God will allow it to become harder and harder so that they will, they'll never repent. And that's what he's talking about here. They've gone too far and they're at the point of no, no return. There's no other offering of salvation. They don't have another way around it. You know, there's not a back door. There's... There's not something else that's not, that's not Christ. John 14 and 6 said, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So if you reject Christ, you have no hope. And that's where these people are. That is the warning that He's giving them. Um, there is no other way. So you look and say, how did, how did things get this far off? How are we talking about this right now? Um, at this warning that is given to them. And really it goes back to the very topic of the spiritual laziness. They're not progressing. The whole reason for the rebuke that is given them. These Christians were under constant pressure to revert to the, to the law of Moses and were quite tempted by it. You know, it was, there was no uh, physical gain. There was no monetary gain. There was no blessing that come from... Um, Earthly, there was none of, no benefit in them forsaking Judaism and coming to Christ. It was quite the opposite. They were immediately put in pressure to return. They were put under persecution. Um, their friends and their family were disowning them. There was a lot of pressure to go back right now. And, and this is why He's warning them. And when you're under all that kind of pressure and you're not studying and you're not growing and you're not, you're not progressing, you're stagnant, you're, you're more than stagnant. You're, you're dying. And when you have that pressure bombarded on you day after day, month after month, and you're not growing, your faith isn't growing, you're going to die. You're going you're gonna to succumb to the pressure. You're going to save face and lose your faith when you're put to the test. And that is the concern here. It's no different for us if we're wondering if this can still happen um, we're probably not going to defect to the law of Moses. I wouldn't think anybody would. Um, but we could denounce Christ for, for other things, for atheism, for uh, so-called science, evolution, agnosticism, or just really sinful pleasures. It could get to that point where you're so, so ignorant of what you should know and what, where you were and where you've, where you've fallen that you just change your mind about Christ in general because you haven't progressed. And that's a very serious thing. So don't think that this is just a warning to, to the old Jews who are now Christians. It's, it's very legitimate to us today. If you're writing spiritually, not progressing in your knowledge and faith, 
Like I said, the same thing will happen. The pressure from the outside world, the things we see every day, the temptations that we have, the, the things that we hear that are from educated people um, will test your faith. And if you're not growing and if you're not understanding and if you're not developing your knowledge and faith in God, then those things are going to overpower the little knowledge that you have and that, are, that you're losing. And it's going to replace it. And that's where you're going to be. You may never get to that point. Hopefully, hopefully not before you realize it, but that could very well happen to us today. The pressure is always there to, to take the easy way out. And if we do it, the result will be the same for us. And uh, that's why we must constantly be growing. But I want to look ahead just real quick. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 26 through 31, talking about forsaking, forsaking the faith. This is a... This is how God feels about it. I hear Hebrews chapter 10, start at verse 26 here. For if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and a fiery indignation which will devour the, the, which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. Here's what I want to look at. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose will he, will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant by which he has sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For we know him who said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. And again, the Lord will judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. And that's the kind of judgment you're looking at when you, when you just disown Christ, when you um, no longer uh, have faith in Him and you denounce Him. You apostatize, as the Word has said. That's what you have to look forward to, that fearful judgment of, of God. who He's looking at you as one who has trampled Him under your feet. You've counted the blood of His Son as a common thing, and you're going to receive a very harsh uh, reward for that. And so, uh, yeah. The last two verses that we're going to cover, verse 7 and 8, is still just furthering this, this, uh, this rebuke here, and it's a warning of you know, becoming unfruitful still. Hebrews chapter 6, starting at verse 7, says, For the earth which drinks in the rain that often comes upon it and bears herbs useful for those by whom it is cultivated receives blessings from God. But if it bears thorns and briars, it is rejected and near to being cursed, whose end is to be burned. So here we have a comparison made between the production of soil and the production of a Christian. That's what he's talking about here. There are two pieces of ground. There are two Christians here that you can say react in two different ways, just like the ground did. Just like the ground did. Both received the same blessings of rain, cultivation, planting, and upkeeping. They got the same resources. Uh, but one brings forth produce very abundantly, and the other brings forth briars, thistles, sage grass, nothing that's good for anything. But they received the same treatment. It's the same soil. And you get two totally different results. And that's what we have when, when we... Uh, the one that produces fruit in the kingdom is blessed. The one that does not pr produce year over year does not take advantage of the nutrients given it, does not take advantage of the Word, and becomes lazy and inactive. This one is rejected near being cursed. And this end will be, the end of it will be hell. Just like that piece of ground that received the same, the same nourishment, the same blessings from God, and did not act, and did not take them, did not, did not absorb those nutrients, and only put out garbage. That's the, the Christian, not somebody of the world, that's the Christian who received those things and did not grow and did not produce. That's what we're looking at here, and that's why I said this is very, it's very harsh, but it's very real. We have a, a, a great judgment coming on us for what for our spiritual immaturity and our lack of growth if if we have it. And that's that's why we must always be growing. 
So it's it's more than a just it's more than just a good idea to be fruitful. It's the expect it's the expectation, and it's the requirement to to grow spiritually and to mature into the Christian that we're supposed to be. Uh, so so concluding, um, that's basically what what I have prepared for us. This was a warning uh, given to the Hebrew Christians. Um, thankfully, from all we read, it, it is just a warning because. It doesn't talk about those who are actually actively falling away in that sense. And we'll actually see that if you... Let's keep reading just the last couple. Uh, Hebrews 6. Read verses 9 through nine through 12. So just after talking about the, the two different soils there in the, the land that yielded up the, the thorns and briars was rejected and you're being cursed and it was going to be burned. Uh, back to verse 9. But beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of which you have shown towards His name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And, and we desire that each one of you show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope in the end, that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. So we end all that harshness on a, we see better things than you. It was a warning to them. It's, it stands today as a warning to us just the same though. Spiritual sluggishness will send us to hell. If we're not, produ- if we're not producing, if we're not maturing, if we're not growing, we are going to be going just the opposite. We're going to be uh, going downhill. So in closing, uh, spiritual laziness, neglect, and immaturity will, re- will lead us to lose our faith potentially, uh, forget the goodness of God's promises, we'll, we'll become unfruitful, and pot- potentially forsake Christ. Those are the things that we have to look at when we, when we say, oh, I don't want to read today. No, I don't want to do that study. It's going to take an hour a week out of my life. I ain't got time for it. I won't go to church this evening. Those are the things that we really need to consider. How we look at our faith. You ain't got time for it. You might as well not be here. We need to be growing. It's a harsh lesson to me and it's harsh le- should be a hard lesson for all of us, but we have to let's step into that responsibility. We can't uh, just willfully and blissfully be ignorant uh, through our Christian walk. We need to be growing day by day. And that's all I have prepared for us. Um, I've stepped on my toes well enough and maybe it's stepped on yours too. If you're not maturing, if, you, if you've lost that interest where you're, you're like that six-year-old on the football team that somebody has to line you up every play, tell you what to do, tell you where to go, you need to consider where you're at. You need to make some changes. We can help you with that or we can help you in any Anyway, if you desire to obey the gospel or make some other public uh, sin right, we'll give you an opportunity to do so while we stand and sing. Thanks for watching this video. I know what you're thinking. I don't want to miss another video from this channel. In order to avoid that, click on the red button down there, subscribe, and then click the bell icon. Not only will that alert you each time a new video is uploaded to the channel, it will also help spread the channel to other people's awareness. So, go ahead, do it, like right now, click on it.